Okay, good morning. Hey, Jonas. Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles open to Judges 17. Judges chapter 17. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so Judges 17. The next five chapters are basically going to be the end of the book. Uh, the interesting thing is we don't actually have any judges to look at at this time because there weren't any more that were risen up. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, that's not true. Um, it won't be till Samuel that you really have anybody that was kind of risen up to judge um, Israel. And technically, it would have been Eli, uh, but that's not until we get to 1 Samuel following Ruth. Um, but historically, actually, Ruth is within, um, actually uh, preceding the last five chapters of Book of Judges, and then Samuel would be the the tail end of that time period within Israel's history. And then we see that Eli would have been the next one that would have risen up, Uh, even though he's not mentioned as such, and he's not, it doesn't, there's no tie-in, but as far as time period, within Israel's history. That's that's what would have followed when we have uh, the occurrences that, that, that transpired there. But um, for chapter 17, we're going to look at a gentleman by the name of Micah. Uh, now this particular guy, he is somebody, uh, again, he's not, he's not a judge. He's just somebody that is mentioned. And for the last five chapters that we see of judges, And actually, to some degree, uh, Book of Ruth, because it falls within this time frame as well, and beginning portions of Samuel, 1 Samuel at least, you have, uh, if you look to, well, okay, chapter 21, verse 25, basically encapsulates what what happens during that time, and that is that, it says, in those days there was no king in Israel, uh, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. <laughs> All right, so that is, uh, <laughs> that is their, <laughs> that is their, uh, their mentality, or that's, that's kind of the situation that's going on in Israel uh, during this time. And so, uh, okay, Judges 17, starting at verse 1, it says, there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, 1,100 shekels um, of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursedst and spakest also uh, in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. <coughs> and his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. You wonderful boy. Okay. You little sweetheart. <laughs> And then when he had restored the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I have totally dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. Uh, Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of the silver and gave them to the founder who made it thereof a graven image and a molten image. And there were in the house, uh, they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of God, small g, and made an ephod and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So now, what tribe was he from? I mean, I know we just read this, but what tribe was he from? Uh, okay. So, is is that legit that he can do? In other words, is he able to go ahead? And no, but he's going to get legit when he gets the right kind of priest. <laughs> okay, and then it says here, um, in those days, in verse six, in those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, we, we're going to see that as a recurring. That's been the recurring theme. <laughs> The only thing is that from now to the end of the book, to chapter 21, we're not going to see any actual judge or deliverer be raised up. And Israel is just basically left to themselves doing what they feel is right in their own eyes. And then there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. 
and he sojourned there. Now this is interesting, okay? Um, he lived in Judah, and his family was from Judah. He's, a, he's from Judah, uh, but it says that he himself was a Levite. Okay. Um, the Levites were actually weren't restricted necessarily to live in a plot of land because they didn't have an allotment. If you recall, when the blessings were given, uh, this is actually going back further, like the end of Ch uh, Genesis, when um, and actually following that, you would have um, when basically the Levites stood up and they defended, they were on the Lord's side whenever Moses came down from uh, Mount Sinai and he was given the Ten Commandments and then the people were basically in living riotous living uh, doing wicked stuff around the golden calf uh, but everybody had had uh, a promise given to them a blessing given to them, well not everybody most of the, tri most of the most of Israel's children were given some sort of blessing, uh, Levi in particular wasn't so he didn't have anything. He was wicked enough that there was nothing given to him as far as you don't have any you don't have any blessing coming to you, you don't have anything. And so they didn't have an allotment. They weren't gonna have a plot of land, they were gonna have any kind of um, inheritance necessarily to look forward to. Now that changed whenever they were at the Mount Sinai and Moses came down because he heard the, the noise that was about in the camp and then he saw that the golden calf was there. Uh, he broke the two tablets, he pulls out his sword and says, who's on the Lord's side? And then Levi stood up and then they killed the brethren that were sinning. And so because of their standing up for their, uh, for what is right, then God blessed and he said, okay, your allotment is to be, you know, the tablets, <coughs> the things of worship of God. Okay, so you yourself are not going to have an actual lot of land. You're not going to have any kind of like physical inheritance necessarily like your other brethren would that they could be able to pass down from generation to generation with the exception of the fact that you are as far as you, you're committed your, your allotment is the service of the Lord so that that pertains to the tabernacle which eventually would become uh, the temple uh, anything service related to the Lord is passed down and that's through the Levites okay so uh, they didn't have they, now because of that um, Mind you, it would make sense that uh, when the temple is going to be raised and wherever God's tabernacle is, is that they would have to be around that. So, in particular, it would end up being in Judah. So they would be sojourning in Judah. But the thing is, they weren't restricted necessarily. To, they could have gone to any other plot of land to go. They, didn't, they weren't restricted as far as, like, you have the tribe of Dan, they would have this plot, or you have the tribe of Ephraim, they would have this plot, or you would have... Um, Naphtali would be over here uh, and such, but the thing is, you would—they they were free to sojourn anywhere. But the thing is, that it would only make sense that you know, he would be where the temple is going to be and the, the tabernacle is going to be. So this particular guy is in Bethlehem, Judah, uh, family of Judah, and he's a Levite and he sojourned there. And a man departed out of the city, verse eight, uh, from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. Then Micah said unto him, Once comest thou? And he said, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I might find a place. Uh, reason why, again, they don't have an allotment like anybody, like everybody else does. So they're, they're, they're nomads in a sense. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victuals, okay, that's thy food. So the Levite went in, okay, so that seems, and then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. Then Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, now I know that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest, all right? So here's the scenario. I mean, that'd be kind of a pretty cool hookup, you know? You don't have a place that's your own. And uh, you don't really have 
any way of making money as a result because the fact is you don't have a land that you work as to how you're going to make your money, how you're going to make your living, how you're going to eat. But you live off of basically the offerings of the people. In other words, the same thing with anybody that was going to be in God's service there as far as that are a Levite. The offerings that were given, uh, that was that's that's their food, that's their sustenance, that's what they that's what they live off of, you know. So, or anybody that would take pity on. <laughs> uh, but other than that, you know. So here's a guy that says, "I'll hook you up. I'm going to, you know, ten shekels of silver by the year, and I'm going to give you a suit of apparel so you get your clothes and thy victuals and your food. So you got food, clothing." plus money, and then, uh, you know, just be here with me, and then, uh, you know, you be my, uh, you'll be my priest. All right, what's wrong with that picture? We have no business doing this. Why not? Well, it's like we saw last week when we were talking about worship. Temple was the place, and the, the tabernacle was the place to worship. And uh, it wasn't wherever you wanted it to be. It was where, basically, the glory of God had led it to be. So you can't just go anywhere and do whatever. So it was a worship issue. Okay, I have three points here, and I'm just going to rattle them off. Stepping, you're stepping on my toes a little bit, getting in my sermon this morning. Which I'm worshiping, palaces of worship this morning. So okay. don't help. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here, here's, here's the three things that you're going to notice. I'm going to rattle them off, but here's the things we're going to see within these two chapters. Actually, you can go on and see these further into the other chapters as well. But, okay, living by... What is right in your own eyes brings misery, heartache, and ultimately death. All right. In other words, it's, it's a foolish way to live. Okay, and that's how they were living, and that that's basically just <coughs> clearly expressed when you see that, not just throughout the whole book, but specifically in these chapters 17 through 21. Okay, they were doing that which was right in their own eyes. They didn't have a king. Now they didn't need a king in order to be able to do right, uh, and it's a shame that. You know, they would cry out for one. Uh, God, when you see that in Samuel, um, when the people cry out, you know, give us a king like the other nations, uh, you know, Samuel mourned, and it was because the fact that they didn't need to have that. It wasn't necessary for them. They had God himself leading them, a uh, perfect judge, perfect ruler, and they also had the word of God, uh, which at that time no other nation had, you know. Because uh, God exclusively had isolated himself to work through Israel and through Israel's descendants. And so they, they didn't need, you know, to be like everybody else. They were supposed to be different. That was God's intent. So that they would, you know, people would know God. Um, they, you know, because he is different. He's not like everybody else. <laughs> That's the thing, you know. But anyway, so that um, living by what is right in your own eyes brings misery, heartache, and ultimately death, and then we'll see this particularly in these two chapters, but uh, God is to be worshipped according to truth and not just spirit, okay? Um, Pastor had mentioned this, and I know this is a series, but, it, you know, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, okay? It's not exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. The fact is, it is possible to be in spirit along in truth, and in fact, that's how we're supposed to be. Uh, God's you know, like, well, okay, we have this, uh, we've had this for quite a while, actually, because of the whole, I wouldn't, it's not exclusive to, like, uh, this is just human nature, but we see it a lot with the Pentecostal and the Charismatic as far as that. They focus on experience, and we have a lot of um, gimmick in church, uh, or places that call themselves church, that try to basically appeal to the flesh because they want to replicate or mimic experience and they want to try and work you. Um, a, a lot of those places are just to, to try and fleece you 
but then a lot of them are just misguided because they 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 don't realize okay they're they 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 turn from truth at some point or it just doesn't because it doesn't appeal to the flesh the fact is that now you're left with okay this this mess of, of, of nonsense that calls itself you know okay this is worship of God but the truth is it's it's far from it and you have uh, people that are walking around you know if they're truly seeking God then the spirit of God is going to bring conviction to them or is going to bring a hunger to them that says okay there's got to be something more there's something different you know as, as the more they get in the word of God they see okay this is not this, this, there's something lacking here and that's really where you go and that when you when you get into truth when you get into the, the word of God uh, then you see okay this is you know it's it's not just according to spirit but it's truth and spirit and in fact that's the foundation the truth is foundation uh, for your, your genuine worship and, and spirit uh, spirit filled that spirit filled connection at where you have uh, connection with God okay and then the third uh, this seems kind of like disjointed in a sense but it says functional familiar relationships are crucial to having a life that pleases God okay the old the one ultimately chooses to do right personally in other words you can come from a messed up family you can come from a messed up background we haven't seen well actually we have seen some of that um, in judges you'll see it more in first kings and second kings first chronicle than even some like in first samuel uh, in particular um, that you have somebody that had a wicked incredibly wicked father grandfather but they, at a young age, chose to not follow the path of their parent and say, I'm going to do right. Uh, King Josiah was one of them. Uh, at eight years old, he's chosen to reign. His father was killed off uh, by God for being somebody that was incredibly wicked. And then his grandfather, his father, was also not somebody that followed God. But he himself said, I'm going to do right. He chose to do right. He lived his right. He lived his life uh, doing right. But nevertheless, okay, the book of Proverbs... <laughs> gives us this concrete truth and it says that um, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it and so those early years uh, in being brought up and, 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 and being trained up uh, as children should be in the nurture and admonition of the Lord are absolutely crucial and again it's not to say that if I come from a messed up family I can't because ultimately the fact is there comes a point where you have to choose to do right you can't excuse off, uh, you know, your sin on, uh, because it was, it was my parents' fault or somebody else's fault. The devil made me do it. Even though you might have allowed his influence in your life, the fact is, <laughs> sin is a choice ultimately at the end of the day. And you choose to do right or you choose to do wrong. And so you don't, you don't, you'll never be able to stand before God and point a finger to him and say, you know, it's your fault. The fact is, it's ultimately, it's your, your own doing where you stand. But it is crucial that, uh, because that sets the course, um, and it makes it that much more difficult as far as when you're older uh, to basically deal with. You end up having a lot of baggage if the if if, <laughs> if your family is not functional, your family life not functional. So you ch uh, choose to have a functional family life. Uh, here's why we say that. Again, this is all precursor to what we'll see here, but in uh, okay, the beginning part of chapter 17, uh, first three verses, was that, okay, he says, this, this um, Micah says to his mom, you know, the 1,100 shekels uh, of silver that are taken from thee, it says, about which thou cursest and spakest also in mine ear, uh, behold, the silver is with me. Okay, and then the mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Okay, so you have... Here's a mom that's cussing up a storm because the money's missing. Well, I know that would make anybody angry, okay, if you got a especially that large amount of sums, 1100 But in it, <laughs> here's a kid <laughs> saying, hey, I was the one that stole it from you, you know, and you're the one that's, Bless you know, you're, you're cussing. Uh, so, I mean, that's not really a good example for the mom uh, to be cussing. And then beyond that, as far as the mom said, you know, Hey, <laughs> the Lord bless you. Okay. 
Is that really functional? I mean, how, how normal is that as far as an interaction between them? You know, it's proof apparent. that older, overindulged children weren't invented in the last century. <laughs> Those spoiled kids today, parents, and just let them. He was growing up for me. Sure. But he's still mama's boy. He had sons, you know that? Because <laughs> he's mentioned that he, he consecrated one of his sons as a. Uh, we actually don't know how old he is. He's going right along with the idolatry. <laughs> <coughs> and then she, the mom. She planned the idolatry. She taught him the idolatry. Mm -hmm. That's the other part that we're going to look at was basically you have the mom here. She consecrated the silver uh, that she had gotten to go ahead and make uh, a graven image and a molten image. Uh, <laughs> what's wrong with that picture? Same thing. It's always been wrong with it. Yeah. The fact is, I mean, God very clearly stated already that there was not to be any Graven image or molten image made, you know, not just graven image, but um, there's no likeness. Uh, you know, there, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, that's is, you know, that's one of the most ost ostentatious rebellions of Catholicism. I mean, this is basically like you know Jewish Catholicism here. It, it really is. It's like it's it's um, they're. You know, it's Israel's Catholicism. They're, they're making graven images to worship God with, just like the Catholic Church makes graven images to worship God with. And it's it's almost identical. It's almost like the manifestation of it in the Church Age versus the manifestation in it in you know the in the um, age of true Judaism. And it's you know, it's just interesting. How not only history repeats itself, but parallels. Uh, you start start to study different false religions, and there's just so many. They're so plagiarized in many ways. They just rip off all the same things. Like Mormonism is. Uh, you took a lot of the writings of Muhammad. Yeah. 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 Was just good. Mormonism is just regurgitated Islam. <laughs> Could you just find the word ostentatious? Flashy. Showy okay. display, like, like it, okay, okay, yeah, like, okay. yeah. I didn't. No, I literally didn't. Like kind of in your face. Gotcha. Uh, bling. <laughs> 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 oh no! no just... <laughs> yeah. Swag. Swag. Are we communicating? Um, it actually doesn't state. Um, <laughs> It follows logically that it would be following Samson's 20 years of reign, uh, but it could have been concurrent. The fact is, he judged Israel. Uh, at this point, there wasn't anybody that was ruling over them at all whatsoever. So it, it just, to me, a logical follows <coughs> this time period is following Samson's rule uh, after 20 years. Um, oh, by the way, also, this is pretty interesting. He says, now... Now know I that the Lord will do good unto me, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. All right? The end of the chapter here. <laughs> got in the box. All right? I got my lucky charm. Uh, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you got some of the younger guys here don't have. When I was a kid, you used to be able to go, like, uh, like when you go to stores, they would have, like, these little machines that you can put, like, a penny or ten cents or a quarter, and then you'd spin it, and you get, like, bubble gum and stuff like that, right? They would have ones that would have like fake jewelry in it, right? Where you can get rings or a necklace and stuff like that. And then they had ones that they would have. Um, I actually never got into the folklore of it. I'm not sure how this even came about. I don't know if it was a European thing or what, but they would have these, like a rabbit's foot. And it would be on a keychain, right? And then supposedly um, the rabbit's foot was a good luck charm. Bring well, good luck. Wasn't so. lucky for the rabbit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's true. Unless you're just talking about longevity. Yeah, <laughs> these rabbits don't last that long, but their foot, you know, if it gets in the keychain, <laughs> might travel, might travel more. So, <laughs> if you had that, then you know, you you know, you got good luck right, coming to you. There was um, That's true. the if you get a four-leaf clover, 
if you find a four-leaf clover in the grass, that was another thing that was supposed to be a good luck charm. Not that uh, clover. Oh, when I have a dead clover. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we had a little saying when we were kids, if you find a penny, you know, find a penny, pick it up, and all day you'll have good luck. Um, like, I have no idea where any of these came from. I just remember learning them. Thank you. Like in preschool and elementary and all that. And so I was like, okay, cool. But I have no idea of the history behind as far as why, what was it that made that, you know, uh, supposedly you got the silver bullet that kills werewolves and then <laughs> like the cross that wards off vampires along with garlic. And uh, again, I don't know why that's the case, but you would think, okay, cool. said it works. Garlic wards off a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's actually good. Yeah, really good. It keeps getting a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a good antibiotic from what I've heard. Oh my goodness. It's, no, seriously. It's got a lot of health benefits to it. But um, anyways, okay, so this guy, Micah, now because he's got a Levite, he figures, hey man, God's going to be with me definitely for sure because now I have a legit priest, not just my own, you know, makeshift priest that I made my son because I don't have, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not of the bloodline, but this guy's legitimate, you know, bloodline for being priest and he's my priest now. And so, yeah, God's going to bless me. God's going to be with me. Again, <laughs> worship of God is according to the truth and not just according to the spirit. Uh, chapter 18, we'll see this again. This is pretty interesting. It says, In those days there was no king. In Israel in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen unto them among the tribes of Israel. And that was in part because they had been disobedient along with a number of the other tribes initially when they were first coming into the land. Remember at the beginning of the book that the angel of the Lord came to Israel and said, you know, I am the one, you know, speaking of God, basically, God is the one that brought you up out of Egypt, and then he's also brought you through the wilderness and given you this land, and, you know, you, you've not gone in to take it, and why have you done this? And so they were disobedient to God initially in the beginning, so they didn't have their allotment yet, so that's, that's why up to this point in time they've just been wandering about sojourning, and they don't have where they're supposed to settle to actually go ahead and work the land and, and you know, receive the blessing that God had had for them. Okay, and the children of Dan sent of their family five men from their coast, men of valor from Zorah and from Eshtael to spy out the land and to search it. And they said unto them, Go search the land. Um, who, uh, when they came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, they lodged there. Uh, and when they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned in thither and, uh, unto him, Who brought thee hither? And uh, what makest thou in this place? And what hast thou here? And he said unto them, uh, Thus and thus dealeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and hath <coughs> priest. And they said unto him, Ask counsel, we pray thee of God, that we may know whether our way may, or which we go, shall be prosperous. The priest said unto them, Go in peace before the Lord uh, your way. Uh, the Lord is... Be, uh, before the Lord is your way, uh, wherein you go. And then five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people uh, that therein, uh, how they do up careless. Okay, and careless in the idea of uh, without worry. They didn't have anything as far as like, uh, you know, to, to be anxious about. And then, uh, Uh, how they dwelt careless after the manner of the Zidonians, uh, quiet and secure. And there was no magistrate in the land that uh, might put them to shame in anything. Uh, and they were far from the Zidonians. They had no business with any man. So this is like basically an isolated tribe, kind of basic, you know, no, nobody's around them, nobody's near them. And they live kind of carefree. And they came unto their brethren, to Zorah and Eshel, and their brethren said unto them, What say ye? And they said, Arise, we may go up against them. For we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. And are and still? Be not slothful to go and enter the possessed land. When ye go, 
You shall come unto a people secure, to a large land for God, and given into your hands a place uh, where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. And they went from thence to the family of the Danites. Uh, and they went from thence of the family of the Danites out of Zorah and out of Eshtel, 600 men appointed with weapons of war. And uh, they went up and pitched in Kirthacherim in Judah, where, wherefore they called that place uh, Manahadan unto this day. Uh, behold, it was Kirjath-Jerim. And they passed thence unto Mount Ephraim and came unto the house of Micah. And then answered the five men that, would, that went to spy out the country of Laish and said unto their brethren, Do you know that there is uh, in these houses an ephod, a teraphim, and graven image, and a molten image? Now therefore consider what you have to do. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. And they turned thither, and, and here's, here's what they, here's what they uh, conjectured as far as what they would need to do. And they turned, turned thither word and came to the house of the young man and Levite, even into the house of Micah, and saluted him. And the 600 men appointed with their weapons of war, which were of the children of Dan, stood by the entering of the gate. And the five men that went out to spy the land went up. Um, and came in thither and took the graven image of the ephod and teraphim and the molten image of the priest. Uh, stood in the entering of the gate with the 600 men that were appointed with weapons of war. And these went into Micah's house and fetched the carved image and ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. Then said the priest unto them, What do ye? They said unto him, Hold thy peace, lay thy hand upon thy mouth, and go with us, uh, and be a father and a priest, and be unto us a father and a priest. And it is better for thee to be a priest unto the house of one man, or that thou be a priest unto the tribe uh, and a family in Israel. And the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the teraphim and the graven image and went in the midst of the people. And then so they turned and departed and put the little ones and the cattle in the carriage before them. <laughs> okay. Now, why that's significant as far as, like, they put the cattle and then the little ones, the kids, in front of them was because that's the first thing that's going to be found or that's going to be dealing with opposition. So if you're in a, basically, like a convoy or caravan, the point is going to be the person or the people or that group that's going to first encounter any kind of obstacle or opposition or any kind of fight. Unless so you, you would want from something in the rear, which is their case. Uh, that's true. So they're looking out for Micah. Okay. And here's here's the thing that's pretty interesting. So here you got this guy, preacher for hire. He's told, you know. You can either come with us. Well, he's not really he's not really threatened necessarily. They just went in and they took whatever they wanted. And then he's like, "What are you guys doing?" He's like, "Hey, why don't you come be a priest unto us?" Uh, if he was going to oppose them, they probably would have killed him honestly. Uh, but they made an offer to him. They they, uh, they wanted to be try and try and be reasonable somewhat. You know. We'll do that and more, and then why don't you, you know, consider the fact that, like, hey, instead of being a priest to one man, you could be a priest to the whole uh, tribe and a family, as opposed to just being the priest of one man. He's like, yeah, sure, why not? And he was glad he went ahead and took everything. <laughs> and so, um, what's going to happen is, is Micah's going to basically confront them. We'll just skip that one because it's a little bit kind of a little lengthy. What's going to happen is, is that Micah is going to confront them, and then Micah's basically going to be put in his place by the uh, children of Dan. And um, then what happens is that the folks come into the town uh, where the people were resting and basically living carelessly, and they killed everybody. They took it, they burned it with fire, and they basically just took over that, that plot. So that becomes their plot, and then skip down to verse 30. Okay, and then the children of Dan set up a graven image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, he and his sons were the priests <coughs> to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. And they set them up Micah's graven image, which he made all the time uh, that the house of God was in Shiloh. Okay, so Dan... The, that tribe were, I, well, they were idolatrous. They were doing whatever they, was right in their own eyes, and then they set up this graven image. And then it says there from a t t time that they were, they went into the captivity of the land. 
and then uh, all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. So, fast forwarding a lot of history, basically, after Israel is actually united and officially a kingdom, because uh, technically, whenever King Saul had taken over, and um, they weren't really fully united necessarily, uh, and then you would see that once the kingdom was rent from him because of his disobedience as uh, David is anointed that you would have because of Saul's jealousy and bitterness he would fight against and he would provoke you know obviously everybody that would want to follow him because uh, they didn't want to get killed because he would kill off anybody that opposed him uh, to, to go ahead and pursue David even though David would was technically God's anointed, uh, and so David was waiting to have John or to have um, Saul removed by God, and eventually, when God removes Saul, uh, rather than the people acknowledging the fact that hey, uh, you know David's God's man, uh, you have a faction of people primarily from Saul's house, uh, and, and those that were still trying to be, I guess, uh, loyal to Saul and to his memory that they would follow, so you still had kind of a divided kingdom and it wasn't like completely united until well after David's rule. And then even then you would have division and faction because of uh, David's sin with Bathsheba. Um, and then you have Absalom and you have a number of other things that transpire. But, okay. Um, during the whole course of Israel's history up to the point to where you have actual, um, not just tabernacle moved to Jerusalem, but then also that you have house built, which wouldn't be till following David, uh, which would be, uh, or temple, I'm sorry, not tabernacle, but you have tabernacle going and then you have te temple built, uh, that you have in Solomon's time, these group, uh, within the nation that have God's word, God's command, and know what God wants for them. Uh, they are going about just worshiping God in their own means, in their own way, uh, basically in idolatry. So here they are, uh, idol worshipers, and there's in uh, the next three chapters we'll see that basically what's going to happen is that they're almost going to get killed off because of perversion that happens, uh, that transpires. And this is all as a result of everybody living according to what is right in their own eyes. This is also because of their worshiping God, again, not according to truth. And to some degree, I wouldn't, I wouldn't place full blame on this, because ultimately the fact is you have, you know, you make the choice as to whether or not you want to obey God and you want to follow God, is that uh, you didn't have very many functional family relationships here. You didn't have very many functional... Um, <laughs> chapters 19 and 20, you see that a lot. You have... Uh, oh, we didn't even get into that yet. You're going to have a Levite, okay? He's going to take a concubine. Um, so a Levite, instead of marrying somebody, he takes himself a concubine. And then uh, he tries to leave with her to just leave out of where, from where, from where her family is to where he wants to go. And uh, the father himself is, is the drunk. He's a drunkard and then gets him to the party. And then he continues that for about a little bit more than two, almost two weeks. Following that, they leave out of town, but they leave later, and then they come into town, and what happens is, is that when they get into town, where the tribe of Dan is basically ruling, you have a scenario similar to what we see in Genesis 19, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. Basically, men come out, and they're like, hey, uh, we want to know this guy. And so the guy is like, well, don't do so wickedly. And then the they offer up his concubine instead. And they're like, hey, you know, why don't you take her and do whatever you want to her, but leave this guy alone because he's a holy man, uh, quote unquote. And then what they do is they basically rape the concubine all night and they leave her for dead. 
and so in the morning she's found like basically on the ground left for dead like she can't even move so the guy's like hey get up we need to go she said can't even move so he brings her in puts her on his on his donkey goes about chops her up into 12 pieces sends her to the 12 tribes and says look look what, what what's done here in Israel and then everybody gets enraged but here's the thing nothing happens to the actual guy okay like I don't get how well first off you shouldn't be given with concubine you should just marry somebody second of all like if this is somebody that you're with and you have actual concern for them why would you send them out to be raped and, and abused like that uh, and then why would you you know why would you do anything why don't you protect this person third of all why would you chop up her body like why don't you just give her a proper burial uh, but it said you, you, you chop up her body to I guess you're, you're trying to stir up anger from everybody that you sent the, the, the body pe the body parts to and then what happens is everybody comes back and they're like oh this is a great wickedness that's done so they go to try and exact revenge. Uh, Tribe of Dan is almost basically eliminated as a result of that. But we don't really read of the guy that actually chopped her up and gave her up to be abused of anything really happening to him. You know, uh, so it's almost as if he gets away with it. We know he doesn't because it, you know, all sins ultimately going to be judged by God, uh, and uh, you know, we hold your sins going to find you out. So. The fact is, living by what is right in your own eyes brings misery, heartache, and ultimately death. Okay? Worshiping God is supposed to be according to truth, not just simply in spirit. And then, um, I can't, I really can't relate with this, even as dysfunctional as some of my family is. The fact is, uh, you know, even though it's, they, it isn't necessary, but they are crucial uh, to having a life that's going to please God. If they would have I can't, I can't relate to that as far as that disassociation with having somebody that is that dysfunctional, that they, you know, somebody's just like a piece of property or a piece of meat that be thrown away. But, uh, all right, does anybody have any questions? Uh, that pretty much ends unless, uh, okay, so next week we'll look at Ruth and uh, a little bit into Samuel to finish out that time period. Questions were dismissed.